Gentlemen, welcome to Center for Architecture and Metropolitan Planning. Welcome to camp, uh, and welcome to another edition of Urban Talks. Uh, I guess it's second uh, Urban Talks lecture of this year, 2023. And uh, as usually, you will have a chance to ask us a question. If you are here in a, uh, in a black hole, as we call it, uh, you can raise your hand. You will get a microphone. If you are watching uh, our live stream, welcome to camp. Uh, also, uh, you have a chance to ask questions questions via slido.com with the hashtag urban talks. Uh, today uh, we have uh guest from London. Uh, Studio Sergison Bates has been founded by uh, Stephen Bates and Jonathan uh, Sergison in 1996. And now it's office of 35 people. And uh, they are working on major projects uh, across Europe. And one of many projects uh, mentionable and featured in media is a Citroen car factory at the heart of Brussels transformed in the Canal Pompidou Museum of Modern Art and Contemporary, Modern and Contemporary Art. Uh, they are based in London, Zurich and Brussels. And please, now uh, I would like to give a floor to Mr. Stephen Bates, co-founder of uh, Sergison Bates. <laughs> Stephen, yes. Welcome here, thank welcome you. to Prague, and welcome to camp. It's yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, and hello, everybody. It's really, really wonderful to be here in Prague, and I'm so happy to see glasses of beer and wine. It's, to me, the perfect way of giving a lecture. Um, when, I fit, when I hear kind of gentle snoozing, I'll know when to stop. As you say, we are working on the canal project, but I'm not going to present that today. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to talk about ideas about the city using certain projects, but again, this isn't really a greatest hits of our work. Um, the title is Figures, Doors and Passages. It's a title that I borrow with great respect from Robin Evans whose essay of 1978 of this title was really about the culture of the plan and how it has and can evolve in the future. The first line of the essay reads, ordinary things contain the deepest mysteries. Beautiful. He continues, Everything ordinary seems at once neutral and indispensable, but it is an illusion, a, de a delusion, and a delusion with consequences too, as it hides the power that the customary arrangement of domestic space exerts over our lives, and at the same time conceals the fact that this organization has an origin and a purpose. And I'm really interested in origins, which I really believe architects should be. You know, we don't enough work our way back to understand the origin of something, a phrase, a term, a condition. And we would really, I think, all of us improve our work if we did start to do that. It brings you back to the very basis of ideas. But this essay is exciting for, for myself because it questions convention. It asks this, it, asks this uh, it gives this challenge of working with convention, but also challenging and reinterpreting it. And we have always been interested in ordinary things, in the way we could ennoble and dignify everyday life through architecture. And it means looking very carefully, often at the things that we take for granted, to understand them ergonomically, anthropomorphically, culturally, to see them as part of a physical and emotional experience, the height of a door. This is a, a, a first very early project of, of my own house. By lifting the door handle height from the conventions of being reasonably low and at the same time dropping the light switch that was, is conventionally slightly higher to bring a kind of 
calm alignment changes the experience of using the space. Your body changes as you lift your, your hand to meet the handle. And where you expect the light, you have to change your behavior. This idea of making oneself more conscious of even the simplest act is something that I think is a, a world in which architecture can operate. It's about also thinking of old things so familiar that can be reinterpreted to hold the imprint of the past, but to feel also new and relevant. That's old experiences as well as old things. It's about being simple, about being deliberate, and about working towards this greater consciousness. <clears throat> and I think our work, a little bit nostalgic here, our work and this kind of interest in the everyday emerged in the 1990s. It's really, I think, important, again, connected to this word, this aspect of origins, but to understand where you come from. I mean, how, why did we make the work we made when we made it? In the, in the early 90s, London was a post-Thatcher place. You know, neoliberal policies were, had, had, had their impact. It was a time of austerity. London was rather empty and rather broken. Deindustrialization was evident. Large areas of decaying land. But there was also a kind of new wealth that was coming from the services and finance sector. There was gentrification that was inevitably following. It's funny, you know, at the time it was really hard to start a practice. And many of our friends and colleagues, um, we, you know, we had hardly any work. We met regularly to talk about what architecture could be. We started to write, we started to teach as a way of kind of making a kind of holistic practice. But all of us enjoyed this broken fabric, this, the additive character of London and the way in which it seemed to accept the new amongst the old without too much fuss. It was that idea of a city that had a level of tolerance it was liberating somehow, and something certainly of an inspiration to us. So when we made one of our early projects, which is this uh, building in Hackney, we were intrigued by the presence of the past of certain building structures that had no obvious use. They, weren't, they didn't identify themselves. They, were, they felt almost like infrastructure. We were interested in how this building that was going to be a, a, a working building and a living building could have that, could share that sort of ambiguity. It was made for three clients, two different families, um, who were connected through their psychotherapy practice and their performance um, uh, group. And they lived in an old uh, unconverted warehouse where the door into their apartment was next to the bath. Uh, spaces were very unclear in terms of their operation, and twice a year, 70 people would um, would perform in these spaces. They were they were clients who uh, questioned everything. They were enlightened. They were original thinkers. Their experimental theatre company meant that they were trying to find a space that they described as an interior that anticipates a public, but is not a public place. It's really interesting. You know? They liked the idea of rooms. You know, we came together because of this mutual belief that a plan of potential was a plan of rooms, not just a sea of space that somehow could do everything. And Typically, of, in this sort of way, they knew a builder. <laughs> and this builder was a, was a, he only knew how to build in timber. So he was a timber frame manufacturer or a timber frame builder. 
And so it was quite clear to us that we had to build a timber co construction. <laughs> um, but that was great because that meant that we could develop a section that was really quite complex because the loads were acting quite differently than they might do in a, a, in a more uh, traditional construction. And most bizarrely, we proposed two staircases in this building that was just 4.2 meters wide by 20 meters deep. And it was really to allow for the two different households to work um, and move around separately from this little yard space off the pavement. It meant that when you arrived in this yard, you were confronted with a number of doors. There was a sort of, un, there was a sort of mystery attached. And indeed, as you move through the house, because of the uh, uh, stacking of the stair, you arrive at, at the, in, on the floor plans at different places on each level. And it made a kind of labyrinthine uh, atmosphere. You'd be somehow, though, guided through the house without quite knowing where you are until you arrive at a certain perspective or an opening that allows you to sort of fix your position. It was a, an architecture that was interested in working with very ordinary materials, materials that are applied directly in their found form with minimum shaping, the thickness suppressed sort of intentionally abstract. The, the facade was a wrapping, whether it be the sort of representational aspect of the front facade that was dictated by the plan as to be brick, or indeed the opening of the back onto a roof terrace using mirrored glazing and, and plywood. Um, the brick of, of, is detailed as a thin slip so it's hung. In fact, the man who made the timber frame added the bricks, like a shiplap boarding, you know, of a house. And then covered, we covered the surface with this loose slurry to make it more, feel more like a kind of worn stone. There was a special aspect to the project because, you know, in those days we could design a window, you know, without worrying about the agrimor certificate and the various uh, insurances. And we worked as we did in those days, and, and in fact still do, with one-to-one -one drawings. This is the condition of a, the stepped window frame, the fixed window and an opening glazed element, where everything is drawn to understand the relationship of things. And it led to thing, surprising issues. Because of the width, you know, we put the window in the corner, which dis it challenges the understanding of the room somehow, because the room doesn't have a corner. It's something that I have to say I find difficult to imagine now, but at the time it was somehow brought out of necessity and it created certain conditions. So the floors are open. They're, they weren't called anything. Of course, we had to place a kitchen somewhere, but this is a family who moved around the house. In fact, they had a rolled up blanket rug, which they used to roll out on the floor and create a certain environment, certain situation from one floor to the, the next. Behind this bed was a little mini grand piano. They were, their parents slept here, the children uh, rehearsed music. It was a sort of very uh, easy, open, ambiguous space. Interiors open to appropriation. This topography, this mystery, even in the smallest of things. It's an attitude that isn't just about the intimacy of the domestic world of the interior, or the interior, but I would say also of the city. London, my adopted city, is a city which embodies its past. It embodies ideas of the picturesque, but also of the mercantile. It's kind of violently pragmatic. Its condition reflects the complex patterns of ownership and private actions that happen in any city, in this case where neither crown nor state has ever really held too much sway. And in diversity, there is a certain tolerance. It's a city of many centers, 
previous satellite towns now incorporated into a broader urban structure. And the richness that comes from it, in part, comes from the connecting parts, the spaces between, the transitional spaces between the very public and the very private. I mean, I'm talking about qualities that you should all recognize in your own fair city of Prague, but of course they're nuanced and a little bit specific. You know, these two images of two beautiful spaces that, are, that I know are so idiosyncratic, and I'm sure if you went around your own city, you could take equivalent versions of these pictures. But London, I think, is relevant from the point of view of understanding our work. And I'd like to read this to you because I think it describes so beautifully the condition that I'm describing. This is an excerpt from Mrs. Dalloway, Virginia Woolf, who wrote Mrs. Dalloway in 1925. Have a listen. Beauty anyhow, not the crude beauty of the eye, it was not beauty pure and simple, Bedford Place leading into Russell Square. It was straightness and emptiness, of course, the symmetry of the corridor, but it was also windows lit up, a piano, a gramophone sounding, a sense of pleasure-making hidden. But now and again emerging when through the uncurtained window, the window left open, one saw parties sitting over tables, young people slowly circling, conversations between men and women, maids idly looking out, stockings drying on top ledges, a parrot, a few plants, absorbing, mysterious, of infinite richness, this life. And in the large square where the cabs shot and swerved so quick, there were loitering couples dallying, embracing, shrunk up under the shower of a tree. That was moving, so silent, so absorbed, that one passed discreetly, timidly, as if in the presence of some sacred ceremony to interrupt which would have been impious. That was interesting, and so on into the flare and glare. I think when you encounter the city on the ground, you sense its intimacy and the palimpsest of layer upon layer of past and present, altered, reused, imprinted with earlier traces. This is Pickering Place in Mayfair. You know, you couldn't believe how busy and public the immediate streets are, because it's right next to Piccadilly Circus, full of tourists. But if you know where this is, you enter a very small doorway. You can see the walls are painted and overpainted with gloss paint. They reflect the light, almost black. You enter what I understand to be one of the smallest courtyards in the whole of the city. It's like a kind of refuge. The city is kind of almost gone from your senses. It's a sort of special place that's made over time, many changes, not always intentionally, but it's there and it has qualities that we should become sensitive to. This is Bridges Place near Covent Garden. Again, you know, really full, center of tourist, tourist field, you know, kind of, if you live in the city, you avoid these kind of places. But you can move through the city, through these passages, almost um, exclusively avoiding the main thoroughfares. This is where the intimacy of the city spaces becomes incredibly powerful. You know, you're rubbing against the walls. You, this is only wide enough for two people, and yet it's a sort of tributary. It's a linking way. It's a beautiful thing. And our first office was not so far from here. We could move through the whole of Bloomsbury just by... Uh, small passageways that link the city. They kind of brought you face to face with the medieval structure of the city, full of um, a past, but also, of course, full of a present. And I'm interested in the generosity of the space between things. 
There is a territorial depth, which I think is possible. And these spaces, these moments, I think of them as gifts. They're gifts that architecture can give to the city. In my own house in Cadiquez, north of Barcelona, we approach the design of this house as a piece of urban repair. <clears throat> urban repair to a very old village in which the, city's, the town structure was built upon uh, houses following the contours of the mountainside as it fell from the Pyrenees to the Mediterranean. It's a town in which you are constantly encountering these subtle or very obvious thresholds that invite use, invite appropriation. It felt natural, therefore, to continue that in, in our project by establishing, for example, a stepped plinth, which you can see is a planter, a bench, a threshold to the front door, a kind of distancing detail from the, between the street, protecting the base of the building, allowing the water runoff of the, the I call it, a, it's not really a street, <laughs> it's not wide enough, but a, the passage, let's say. Um, so the, the little plinth is a kind of protecting detail device, but it's actually, of course, a spatial one. This creation of a stoop entrance with a bourgonvia, which is trained to create this sort of bow of, uh, of place. The window. Here's a detail here. You see this, this little window that opens into the staircase that drops down into the, the cellar. It's almost like a wayside shrine. Indeed, we use it as such, a little place to display, to sort of define that we're here. But it becomes a kind of partner to those sitting on the bench, a sort of a partner, a friend. These thresholds attached to the building, but of the town, forming part of the urban experience, that help define the character of the city and its scale and its material are, of course, the realm of architecture and our responsibility. Here you see the occasion of, a, of an evening drink where the street becomes a social space, a stage. The steps and stoops either side become inhabited edges. On the right, the recent Zara fashion shoot, you know, using the bench as a background. This is a short film of the harbour building that we completed recently in Antwerp. The territorial depth achieved with this arcade that links harbour side to the communal garden relates to this interest that we have of what we call the third place, as coined by Ray Oldenburg in his 1989 essay, The Great Good Place. He was a, an urban sociologist writing about the importance of informal public gathering places for a functional civil society. It just reminds me, though, of the responsibility we have as architects to form these kinds of spaces and to protect them when they already exist. These kind of spaces are, and moments are all around. You just have to become aware of them. And this is why we talk about the importance of observation and survey. Our relationship to the environment that surrounds us and our capacity to connect with it, to spatially reference it, to mentally absorb and adopt it, you could turn it off now, is the key to the way we experience it. These spatial relationships through, and though specific to their cultural location, are also universal in some way. And with care and nuance, they can become relevant in different conditions. So I want to present um, 
three projects, two recently built and one soon to be built. The first project is in, in London, it's in Lavender Hill. The site lies on the crest of a land form that falls down to the Thames with Clapham Common above it and Battersea Park below it. A part of the city that really until relatively recently was open farmland until the end of the 18th century. It was used for cultivating lavender, believe it or not. But now is a sort of busy shopping and commuting street. It links Clap see, Clapham and Battersea to, in southwest London to the rest of the city. And the project involved the redevelopment of a former engineering works. This is the site here. <clears throat> which is located inside the terrace block, a very usual condition. So we have a classic sort of uh, Victorian terrace block. This is the, the, the main road of shops going down to the River Thames here. This is the, to, the, to the north, and this is the south, so the ground rises up. And in, embedded in the block are very often industrial working buildings that have had many lives, and indeed many have fallen to pieces. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side the, the kind of condition from inside, where behind the rather formal terrace, English terrace house frontage is this kind of chaotic, um, very bespoke, very kind of improvised interior. Many party walls, many boundaries, very complex overlooking issues. So a kind of nightmare, <laughs> you could say. Um, you know, every single window looking into the space will have everyone who's behind those windows has something to say. So we have a kind of intense characteristic. And the, sp the spatial strategy was generated by this sort of enclosed nature of the site. So as it was surrounded on all sides by neighboring houses and indeed was somehow bedded slightly into the ground, as you can see from the section here, so you can see the ground rising up and the, the, uh, the, the ex existing ground level. <clears throat> we had very limited outward prospect, particularly at ground level. So our idea was to make a single building that fills the site with a courtyard garden at its center. Access is through an a building, in very normal condition, you know, a, a wooden gate. Uh, you can just see the gate here, open, um, into a muse, which originally would have run right through the block, but in the 60s was closed by a wall with a little nursery school placed at the back. But this is the way in, very discreet. Um, the, the client also owned this building, which they refurbished into a family home. It's a space that has cobbles on the ground, partly reused cobbles, partly new cobbles that uh, identify certain territories and map-like spaces. And off this space, there's a sort of opening. So linking the muse is this timber-lined passage. Giving the whole development a kind of intimate, collegiate, collective character with inside and outside spaces merging in a rather informal way and providing many thresholds and layers. As you, as you enter this space, you realize the ground is slightly dropping. So your weight, your body weight falls forward because it's a very gentle ramp, ramping section. You sort of almost trip <laughs> into this private garden. <clears throat> it's a garden that's just six meters by 12 and a half. It's heavily planted with multi-stem fruit trees deciduous and evergreen shrubs and grasses, perennials of woodland flowers and climbing plants. Kind of an eclectic, consciously an eclectic choice. So that not only does it have a varying character through the seasons, but 
it is a sort of offer to the residents to add to the planting, you know, without keeping to the concept. So there's a sort of gentle encouragement to, to add what you like to, the, to this, gray, uh, this green space. There are clay brick pathways that lead to small clearings, thresholds, creating uh, a little clear space by each of the front doors, which is big enough to, for a couple to, of chairs to be placed so that it could be used in the manner of a stoop. This is the plan that shows nine dwellings, nine little houses, all accessed off this courtyard space. So this is the mews, this is the gate, the mews, and the little passage leads you past this staircase into this space. As you walk down this, you know, the sound of the city is beginning to break away. You know, it, the sound of cars are replaced by the sound of aeroplanes and the sound of the radio and the conversations that are going on within this sort of micro community. So each of the dwellings is accessed from the garden and the, the dwellings are arranged generally around a private courtyard space at the ground level, which you can see hatched here around which there are rooms, which we imagine would mainly be for sleeping. And you'd go up a staircase to a second outdoor space, which is an open uh, terrace, deck, wooden deck terrace, that is always placed adjacent to the patio. So there's a sort of large piece of sky that each of the houses enjoy, and an interconnectiv interconnectivity visually um, across the floors and spaces. So the, this, it means, you see, that the garden is just one centre, but each of the houses has its own centre and secondary centre, that there are a series of, let's say, small worlds that build up the project. Because in the end, it is a collective project, but I think for collective living to really work, the private space has to be the best it can be. I think when you feel secure enough and comfortable enough in your private space, only at that point will you begin to venture into a kind of more collective environment. So we imagined that the garden would change from season to season, maturing over time, flowers fading and blooming, tree canopies thinning and filling out, low shrubs spilling over the pathways, you know, those pathways are actually width. The width is determined by wheelchair provision, but the choice of plants mean that, you know, over a period of time, that width becomes sort of diminished, you know, becomes less dominant. That this was always an idea of a garden first and foremost, and the way to get to your door was a sort of secondary act. The section shows this arrangement of um, this is one dwelling. So you can see the ground floor patio, which you see here, and then the first floor terrace. And this becomes a kind of ensemble, which is enclosed by a glazed screen on two levels. that gives a sort of light fluidity uh, to the overall ensemble. And then here is the courtyard. And on the um, north side is a three-story part of the construction that has this Logia on the first floor to get into maisonette apartments behind. So this is a ground floor apartment, and then these are um, two-story apartments that have behind the brickwork uh, open brick screens for the private space to the to the living apartments. You know, we were interested in how the character of this project could have a more industrial sense to it. The idea that this building could almost feel like something that you've that has been reused. On the right hand side you can see the ceiling plan of an exposed roof structure that sort of gives the quality of a workshop rather than a let's say certainly in this part of London what you'd expect in a domestic situation. A view of the fluid living space. You can see down to the patio across to the 
to the first floor deck, which is always alongside the kitchen, which is just behind that screen. Um, and you get a feeling that the structure defines a series of territories by its direction. There's something about a resilient character. Something about the sense that this doesn't have a singular purpose. That the rooms are, let's call, all-purpose rooms. It's a sense that you might have inherited a building from a former use. It's not overtly domestic, more like a warehouse or an almshouse. And slowly but surely, there are signs of appropriation. Slowly, the tenants, it's, just, it's a rented project, that the, uh, and only one, since we finished it, only one change of uh, tenants, uh, tenancy. So bit by bit, this group of people are becoming known and to each other and become kind of fiercely protective, actually, of this space. These signs of appropriation is the, the next layer of, of course, of the, uh, is facilitated, we hope, by the architecture itself. And like the interiors, the new facades reflect this sort of industrial heritage of the site, the, the has-been, the memory of what this type of space could be. They connect with a certain idea about Victorian architecture that celebrated industry. You know, it celebrated buildings that made things by developing ornate brickwork and enjoy, you know, enjoying the process of industrial making and production. And these twisted um, header courses and lintels are all developed to kind of connect to that sense. The pilasters that are, oops, sorry. The pilasters, which are these vertical sections, are partly structural, but really they're more form-making to give a kind of vertical formal characteristic to the, to the overall ensemble, where windows kind of move, uh, let's say, with, they're, they're placed within the structure, but their opening has a sort of tolerance to it. There's a, solid, a combination of solid and glazed opening. They could almost be changed. You, know? you could imagine in another life, that these, built, these windows are part of a transient aspect to the project. The second project that I describe as living inside the block. I mean, it's a, it's a very different condition, but uh, actually, because this is in Munich, in Heidhausen, which is a part of the 19th century city based upon Beaux-Arts planning. So, very formal streets um, with you know, radial geometries and the consequence is very complex urban block structures. But we showed this painting of Carlos Marago to the client very early on because we were fascinated with what it really means to live inside the block. You know, this is a condition that maybe as designers and creative people that you're familiar, you feel okay with that. But to a real estate developer, you know, where's the front door? You know, where, where does the post go? But how can I sell this? Is there immediate concern when I don't have a high street address? So, you know, we were fascinated with what does that mean as an architectural typology where your front door is quite far in to the off the street. So we showed this picture that showed a set of thresholds and Alongside that, through my own teaching in Munich as a, as a professor of urbanism and housing, um, we've been exploring over many years now the transitional spaces and connecting spaces through models. These are all one to ten models photographed extremely carefully, um, made by the students as a way of drawing their attention to these spaces, to see the qualities of those spaces, and, in, and of course to learn about how to make things precisely, how to photograph things precisely. Um, this model, by the way, is this model, which is 2.8 meters long in order to get the depth of field. And you can see that they're models that are made for a photograph. Um, they're made with great care and observation. And it relates back to this point I mentioned about gifts that you know, we, I think, have to hold carefully these treasured spaces 
uh, to, to protect them from the world that doesn't see them as important. And I, I must say, I think they define cities. So we should really protect them and get to know them and celebrate them. So we showed also these kinds of spaces because they are the kind of deep front door of a project that is in the end set right inside the block. This is the consequence of Beaux-Arts planning, you know, a triangular plan, a block, really long. Um, in Munich, they're very long blocks. You know, when you're walking one block, you really notice it. Uh, I notice how different it is from other cities I know. Even New York, it feels longer. But inside, this is the site. And the client, we started on the project with this site, but then the client bought this building, which was absolutely brilliant for us because it meant that we could develop a set of connective spaces. You can see the first sketch here of a head, two heads, let's say, and a tail building, alongside which are a series of porches and gateways and courtyards. So from the street, this is the, the main uh, Franziskernerstrasse, which is the, the formal, you know, de there's certain decorum, you know, a, a way of behaving. Architecture needs to behave in a certain way. So our new facade sort of does the right things, you know. It works with a bay, it works with a consistent eaves, it works with a roofscape, but of course it does so always learning from the past, but nuancing and finding a kind of new expression that can work with old trades. This is a detail of the gateway entrance where the, the bay is asymmetrical. It hovers, creates a kind of canopy over the entrance and the wall is plastered, plastered with the very thick um, troweled plaster, which is a, has a, there's a strong tradition in Munich of, of this plaster work, which I don't really see so, well, so, uh, so clearly here in this city. So you enter this gateway, corners are rounded, there's this powerful texture, lights are pressed up into the ceiling, partly for the lighting effect, but partly so that a fire engine can drive through here without knocking the lights. And off this space, which is the gate here, there's a recess, soft recess, which is the way into the front building. And this is a lift for the bicycles. So this is this space. You enter a dark space, but this promise of a, another top lit space, another passageway, another top space. And from this point, you see the beginning of another passage that opens to another court, and then another passage that brings you to the adjoining street. This is a building that is episodic in its character. You never experience it as a single whole, but as a series of parts, a series of let's say, moments when you break out of this covered space into a small yard and the treatment of the elevation and the scale of elements is treated in relation to the scale of that space, not in relation to the overall. The complex form making is, is really a, a consequence of the very tight regulations for light and air and view that were dictated by the planning um, the planning. Uh, office. Some details that show this experience of a building that seems to have a kind of horizontal, generous aspect to it, which you'll see why in a minute from the plans. But uh, it, it, it's trying to balance maximum glazing with dealing with privacy. So in front of the windows is a net of very fine cable uh, steel um, thread, which is coiled together, you'll see in a second, that makes a sort of cobweb that could, of course, uh, take plant, ground plants climbing, but even without, acts as a sort of veil. This is the second, the final courtyard to the restored building that the, I mentioned the client bought. That building we, had, we kept, restored it, these are the facades that look into this space. And this is the passage that we have made certain adjustments to that brings you to the street. Here you can see a kind of attitude to working with conventions that are known, but finding 
you know, a kind of nuanced expression. Here, the veil. This is a sketch that shows how it's composed. It's of a single cable. There are no tightening bars. You know, it's done all through weaving. So it gives a sort of soft, organic characteristic to it. You know, this, to me, is a very important sketch because it describes this idea that the, the building comprises two heads. And these heads need to conform to the Grundesite spirit of uh, 19th century residential type. And then there is a sort of other building. What is it? You know, it's not a warehouse. It's not, certainly not a house. It's a type that we have to kind of find an expression for. So the images before are kind of our, our idea of an expression of that, which, by the way, I was going to just say, um, have front doors to um, two-story houses here. So it's a sort of intimate front with a, a room next to the front door that can open into the courtyard as a sort of flexible room. And then above that, a series of apartments, which I'll show you. <clears throat> and so a typical plan shows, you could say, you know, the conventions of room upon room, hall connecting through diagonals, um, all, you know, language that we perhaps all as designers and architects know. This is the existing arrangement where we made only a few changes to open up certain things but otherwise a set of room with connecting a set of rooms with connecting doors but where it gets interesting is that in this space def this form defined purely from where we can build and of course the pressure of a developer to say minimum staircases we end up with a condition that uh, becomes quite intriguing that th here's the front you know a kind of polite architecture and yet on the inner building the, uh, the architecture evolves as a sort of landscape a connective landscape there's a a long way to be, between the front door and the final private space this is a this is a living condition in which time comes into play the the apartment reveals its, itself as you move through it we showed references like this which is a of a, a detail of a project that we've made in london and a sketch that shows a kind of loose arrangement of interior walls in relation to structure there's a sort of transience and this idea of solids where bathrooms and storage became kind of uh, almost urban ideas of solids between open fluid space so just three examples of the conditions of inside. You have, from the core, you enter the very far corner of the apartment. And the view, there's a long view of our patio with lights coming from the top alongside the kitchen. And when you get to this point, you, there's a completely new vista towards the central courtyard with this adjoining room, a kind of walk through bathroom and changing between two bedrooms. And on the upper parts of the building where the roof starts to enclose the space um, the apartments get even longer I'll show you in a minute you come you enter you enter this apartment from a lift and there's almost almost like an apartment size space here and then a very long connective space to courtyards and bedrooms and in this case another situation where the, there's almost an idea of urban planning in the apartment interiors this is a demonstration of an interest that we have of um, designing form not as absolute objects but as something experienced in parts, something experienced in an episodic way. And I like these pictures because it makes no sense to say when you remove the model from the context, this project. I mean, what is it? It's a sort of weird thing. Um, quite maybe intriguing also. It's the, it's the consequence of a set of conditions that actually allowed us to then make a plan that you would never usually, that you'd never usually make. And I see a relationship between how the city presents itself with linking spaces and special moments, places of rest, places of passage, 
some comfortably interior, others ambiguously neither inside nor outside, with the making of interiors. This is a plan which I hope all of you know, uh, the plan of the Bank of England by John Soane. I think it sums up so well this idea of, uh, that I describe of this set of inner worlds, the idea that you could introduce and can introduce mystery into the making of plans. What I find so radical with Soane is that, you know, I mean, he worked on this project for 20, 30 years, I think, from uh, 1877 through to at least 1815. And, I mean, this is a bank that wanted to express power and certainty and might. And Soane <laughs> radically offered almost the opposite. He offered theatre, drama, mystery, blind entrances, you know, a labyrinth, a labyrinth of interiors and exteriors, or a kind of city within a city. And I find it an extraordinary situation. But I combine that with this statement of Casha de Mignoni. I am an architect to the last detail. I find urbanism everywhere. In reality, the apartment is a little city with its paths, its constraints, its social and private spaces. I have always had a passion for small spaces and have always wanted to make them look larger. For example, for example by lengthening the roots, contrary to some tendency to reduce them. I don't like a direct entry into the living room because then there are no surprises. I think that this, I find it extremely uh, inspiring, let's say. And it might seem strange to bring John Soane and Casha de Mignoni together, but I find so many interesting parallels and certainly, as I say, inspiration when thinking about making a plan. The mystery in not revealing everything in the first moment, the promise of something, the need to move through in time and space. On the right, this is a, a view from the rotunda to the passage. A kind of, you can't quite see where you're going, you know. You, you're directed by uh, the light above. There's a sense that the passage must carry on. Actually, by the way, it leads very quickly to two doors, one of which is a blank door, the other one you go through. Casa di Mignoni's Piazza Carbonari, the bedrooms are organized around this really beautiful five-sided hall space. But the detailing of the doors allows this space to become absorbed on certain occasions with the whole set of rooms. There's a, so an open territory on the one hand, but the possibility to make five separate territories just by the detailing and the closing of the doors between the spaces. These interests became a subject invest of investigation on the mansion block project that we finished in 21, made in, Hans in Hampstead, we were drawn to the aspect of a society of rooms, or a suite of rooms, which enable a more general or contingent planning, rather than a directly functional or specific approach. The project was commissioned by Pegasus Life, who were a specialist developer interested in providing alternative living options for older residents over 60 years old. So you could only uh, buy these apartments if you met that criteria. Our first sketches demonstrate this interest in building up diagonal connections by working with rooms of more than four sides. Um, to create a, uh, let's say, an integral cellular structure where there isn't evident hierarchy between, say, a room to sleep and a room to live. It becomes a constellation of interconnecting rooms of different shapes. There's no obvious hierarchy. So the project is of two building forms connected at ground level um, with this space, which is a very much a consequence of the urban setting. But what you can see, I mean, your first glance is that it's a single structure, you know, not a set of different apartments. Indeed, 
very possibly you could join apartments by opening up of the walls because none of these walls are structural and load bearing it's a there is hierarchy of course around a central what we call middle room in each apartment that is acts you get to it via the first room and i mean i never forget the board meeting when i first presented this plan <laughs> can imagine can you? They're big models you know really earnest and I described the conditions of the mansion block tradition um, that came from France to England and we copied it radically it was very, we moved away from house building to large apartment building and um, that condition was often a very deep plan you know where you'd enter an apartment a long way from the facade Anyway, I was describing it, and there was complete silence in the room. <laughs> you know, God, I thought, okay, I should get my coat and leave. This is it. It's not worked. And then from the distance, a voice, oh, I, I could sell those. And the, <laughs> the whole atmosphere changed. Suddenly it was like, oh, really? Oh, uh, And we left with this project. I, I mean, none of us could believe it because it was way too radical, we thought, for such a developer. Um, but they understood that this was a very specific response to a condition of living in later life, in which your world quite literally gets smaller. There is, um, you spend more time at home. Home becomes very important, but home is inevitably sort of shared with people, strangers, carers, uh, helpful children you know your private world is diminished and we were really interested in how we could retain a set of thresholds and choices for the owners of these residences to kind of selectively invite guests further in and here's here are two plans just to give you an idea you come off the core here into this space and immediately you can actually sense this window because you just as I, as you just, you could see from the sown condition, the the promise of light means a lot. So this is quite a dark space, intentionally so. You know, to explain to a developer that dark spaces were good, that was a challenge. Um, and then you go to a slightly lighter space because this is connected to a um, little uh, winter garden, um, which itself is a sort of passing space between the kitchen and the, and the living space. This is an opening, not a door. You could imagine this is the middle room that could be a table with the utility next to it. But from this first space, there are two suites. They're almost completely autonomous. Bedroom, changing, bed, uh, bath, bathing, where a couple could live, but say sleep separately. A couple could live with a carer living or with a family member. But the you, your world is not revealed, you know, to anyone who walks in to an open plan flat, for example. And the, the market in Hampstead, because the understanding was that the people, the new residents would really be coming from the local neighborhood, are really coming from very large houses. They're downsizing into these quite complex, big apartments. So what their expectations are are high, and they have lots of storage requirements, etc., in this other apartment, which is on the higher part of the building, um, you can see through spaces. So you can walk behind the kitchen as a way of getting from the public space to the more private world of these bedroom suites. Or, of course, you can choose to go from the entrance in. So they sort of become a labyrinth, a little city with its paths, with constraints, with social and private spaces. There's always the promise of something more just around the corner spaces unfold with a degree of anticipation you understand a room as a sort of fragment somehow it remains hard to comprehend because you only fully understand it when you're in it and then there's another offer another promise it's very connected to those ideas that dominioni describes so this central room i describe both connects but also separates it gives control back to the homeowner rather than the guest. It connects rather obviously, you could say, with the work of Hammershoy 
his interior paintings of his apartment in Copenhagen that consistently explored with consistent nuances too uh, the idea of the inner world of rooms, making connections both with social and personal consciousness. But it was made possible by an understanding of structure. This is a, uh, you can see, exposed structure and the setting out of the interior. And by the way, I really like this. I, always, I like to show this because I, found, I photographed this on site, as you can see. The contractor, the builder, had pasted the, base, uh, the foundation plan uh, the, sorry, the structural plan on the wall. And you can see the cores, but you can then see that this structure is a, it doesn't follow an obvious grid. It is like a forest. You, know, you can begin to sense it here. It's a, set out by spans, but it's really understood to be reinforcing the external form and creating a kind of forest structure. But I like it because of the way he stuck, he stuck it on the wall. Because these sort of mimic the Strange uh, fin structures. I don't know how conscious that was. I'm sort of very conscious. So this idea of a the building as an infrastructure that meets a very specific requirement in on the interior, but could live well beyond its first use, has to be balanced with building in place. You know, Hampstead is a very protected part of the city. It has extraordinary architecture from the sort of third generation arts and crafts movement, so the late 19th century, early 20th, and making a kind of flimsy modern building. It just would not work in this space. We had to invent an architecture that could be robust enough to, to work with those conditions. And we did that by understanding that there are powerful forms like belly bays, extrusions, bay windows, that we could transform in a, a kind of different way. This is Richard Norman Shaw's um, Albert Hall Mansions, which was the mansion block reference that we showed. And indeed, his own house is just close to the site. And this is the kind of architecture of the locality. It is so confident, so brave. It, joy, it really enjoys form making. You know, this, is, this is the architecture pre-modernization where architects were learning about new construction capabilities. They were definitely not losing the past, but they were working with a kind of joyous eclecticism that was then, of course, completely killed off in the 20s and 30s by certain people <laughs> who we all think are important. Of course they are, but so are these people. So we had to find answers. You know, the, Our answer was a bay window that you know, historically is understood as an object placed on a wall, could start to actually be a form that's extruded, that creates a kind of enveloping, unwrapping facade. That the roofscape, very important word in planning terms, you know, a roof in this area, big roofs, uh, but we need to inhabit that roof. That roof could have its own geometry, you know, a kind of looser geometry that uh, with a different type of detailing. It's an architecture that is learning from its place, but is overtly contemporary. You know, it is almost completely exclusively in brick, apart from the ceramic tiles that reference sort of the ter terracotta detailing of the neighborhood. Um, an architecture of two strong forms with gaps between, because this is the tradition in the area where you see into trees and gardens behind. And the entrance porch that is a, of an arch that isn't a historical classical arch, actually. It's a flattened, flattened arch. And uh, how do you work with arches, you know? <laughs> Should we never use an arch because we're modern? I mean, that's pathetic, isn't it? We've got to, we've got to be able to work with form. So we try to make, we try to work with these arch forms and these belly bays. I can tell you it was a very scary process where many of our, let's say, perceptions and preconceptions of what we should do as architects were really challenged. I'm grateful that we found a way through. <clears throat> we're always seeking an architecture which mediates with its place, which offers itself with generosity to the city. 
in which it forms part. It is of the city, imprinted by its spaces, its materiality, its thresholds. And that means there's a level, a level of allegiance and reconciliation to what is there already. But what is interesting is this aspect of mediation, which relates to notions of transformation, because a definition of mediation is not just compromise, but actually one definition of mediation is to prepare for change. And I think that is what we're really interested in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I just mentioned that you have a chance to ask questions. Uh, if you will raise your hand, uh, you will get a microphone from my colleagues. And uh, if you're watching our live stream, you can uh, ask. Uh, also, use uh, slido.com uh, via hashtag uh, Urban Talks. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, for your lecture. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, detailing and uh, uh, other things in the ground floors uh, different than we see uh, in actual developments and uh, actual new projects in Prague, for example. When we had a developer here uh, last month, I asked him about the, wh why is the reason that uh, the flats they are talking about are luxury? What's mm. the difference? And they said, oh, we used a real stone there. There is a real stone around the, around the corner and around the doors. Uh, why clients should invest in these spaces, in these details? Wh wh why is it important and why they don't do it? Is that a question? Oh, I thought you were just criticizing the developer there. <laughs> yeah, kind of, but uh, I've seen that you do it and uh, it's I mean, first of all, you know, every, let's be realistic, every project is different and the clients are different and a good client is what you need to make a good project and we work with terrible clients like probably everybody here, as well as good clients. So you have to pick your battles and you win your victories in different situations. And as I described in this project, it's a very specific situation. What I would say though is that the conversation that we try and have towards luxury or generosity is in how rooms connect and how we make things, how we make relationships. And it's less reliant on a stone threshold, which would be nice to have, I'm sure. But it doesn't need that. And I think it's you know, the role of the architect, of course, is to try and nudge and influence those who are paying for the project to see the potential beyond their own idea. And, you know, where we can do that, we do. So... Of course, I mean, putting stone and saying luxury, I, I, I've heard it all before. I mean, obviously it's not, because the stone is probably this thin for a start. So it's not really luxury. And, and I, you know, I think after a few years, you can start to say that. And I do say that with a smile on my face. But uh, I'm not really sure what the question was. Did you know what the uh, question was? Uh, I'm asking about the details and about okay, sculptural yeah, yeah. Uh, design of uh, those passages of and uh, yeah. semi-public spaces. Yeah. Uh, if there is an importance of, from your point of view yeah. uh, for people who use them, I if, yeah. uh, there is a... Well, I think the project in Antwerp, you know, the, the discussion we had with the developer was to prioritize. You know, where, would we, where would we be able to work more carefully in detail than other places. And because the interiors in that case are very often fitted out by the owner, we were able to um, encourage and in fact we uh, help the client understand that that passage was a kind of representation of the project itself. To us, of course, it was a connecting idea of the city and which he understood too. And so therefore there's a priority of detailing, a priority of emphasis. And w I, it's a little bit like my mantra in the office that I, I think we should make good front doors and we should make good inst institutional spaces. And I just hammer on about that. And I, I find if I start talking early enough to both the office members, but also the client about them, they often might survive.
Yeah? Okay. Because usually they, they, they're seen usually as the first thing to cut. That's my point about the gift. You know? As architects, you, 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 because you can't tell anybody what it really is, okay? it doesn't, suppose it doesn't redo really anything, developers or clients think, oh, well, it has no value. And our job is to explain the value in those kinds of spaces. Uh, there's another question. Uh, do you learn from the past projects? Do you go of to course. visit them again yeah, yeah, to yeah. see if people use them as you predicted? And is it predictable and repeatable? How they use it? <laughs> yeah. How they are happy there? I love these really general questions. Um, of course, we, we're very interested in revisiting and learning because that's what we should do. I mean, surely. Because <laughs> we take risks, we experiment through work. I mean, this project was a massive experiment in form making. You know, I, was, I thought we were making the worst postmodern building at one point, but somehow it worked out. But I, I would say that we are really interested in experimentation, and therefore, in order to be able to evolve and make better things, you have to look back from what you've made and learn from it. And sometimes you, uh, you've made a mistake, but very often you can build upon something that you has seen does seem to be successful um and then of course there are many nice surprises as well i was explaining to someone in an interview earlier about certain things that we were okay. discovered in projects uh, that we have a first question from public uh from reggie uh what can be done by architects to bring sensitivity poetry and originality back into architecture as opposed to copying other architects work what does he think i mean You know, Do we have a reggae here? I'm not God, you know. No. I'm just, you know, what I, by the way, you know, this lecture is really intended just to make you think and get excited about what you do. Because I don't, I mean, I'd love you to like our work, but it's also not really that important. What's important is that you look at the city and find answers for yourself. And I, I think that this sort of question is as if I have the, the, the answers written down on a page. I, you know, I, I don't. I'm working it out, but you have to start with an ambition. You have to start with an ambition to, to, for architecture to work in a bigger way than is often the case these days where it's seen as an image or, you know, with globalized digitalization, you know, architecture is just sort of two-dimensional. And I think we don't accept that. And I think you just move through, walk through a good city and you see that. So that's my answer. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Good answer. Uh, there is a chance for you if you want to ask something. Yeah, answer, ask Someone's. me some nice questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Welcome uh, to camp. Hello. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, and I would like to ask, speaking about ambition, the last project you showed us, uh, that idea that you wanted to develop. Uh, did you first have the idea and then were searching for someone that would be let's say, brave enough to uh, to go with that? Or, yeah. or did, yeah. did you answer a certain brief? So we made the bid for the site with the developer because it was for sale, this site. It was the biggest site in Hampstead um, that had been available for 30 years. So it was a, everyone was very interested in it, very difficult situation. And the developer needed to make it work because they had to put a big price in. So they, we needed it to be very dense. And they said, only two cores. You can't use more than two staircases. And <laughs> when you lay out the site and put two stairs, it's like massive distance. Where, who's the speaker? Who asked the question? Ah, there. So big distance you know, between the stair and the perimeter of the site. Um, And that's, I immediately was reminded of the mansion block tradition. I mean, particularly uh, the Richard Norman Shaw's mansion block, which I'd visited because it was next to the Royal College of Art where I studied. And the plans are really deep and they somehow work. And then I, uh, for some time, have been interested in the hall, the hall plan, you know, like a middle room. And you, we realized that, you know, of course, if you add another side to a four sided space, something interesting happens because diagonals appear and you, the room becomes a sort of rotational space, not a directional space, not obviously orthogonal. And that was going on. And then 
in our office, we had this lovely Spanish architect. And usually at that time, our office was many, many Northern Europeans, very serious, you know, a few too many Germans, a few too many Swiss architects. I was happy that some proper Iberian blood was... And I, I, I thought, Jose, you know, we're going to work on this. And we started working on this idea of a cellular plan. So we were scribbling, kind of, and we realized that if you connect room upon room, you kind of get from the stair to the outside in a progressive way. And that, those sketches were the first early sketches of that condition. And of course, there are black references of Diminioni and you know, Roman architecture, of course, all of that stuff. You know? But bit by bit, we began to feel there was a real, realistic idea even though we thought they'll never accept this. but So we had a big, big model at 1 to 20, so you couldn't really see the crazy plan. You could just look through the doors and see other spaces, and we relied on the model to present it. That's when it all went quiet. So, But it all worked out. Does that answer slightly? Yeah. Uh, okay, There's, uh, is there any other question? No? Yes. Welcome to camp. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I just have a question because you have a very varied um, European practice in different cities. Yeah. And speaking of cities, I was just wondering whether some cities you find more receptive to these new ideas and what kind of dictates um, how well accepted the ideas are, mm. whether it's the people in the cities or the local authorities or historically. Good. Interesting. Well, first of all, just a bit of kind of detail. So we have um, our base is in London, and from London we work on projects in mainland Europe. We have a, a second office in Zurich that concentrates really on projects only in Switzerland, sometimes Germany, but mainly Switzerland. And then when we won the Canal Project, we established an office in Brussels. Um, we've always understood our practice as a European practice, and, and that has meant that we had to be ready to move and travel through teaching that became also possible and um, and we have this belief that there's that the European city is sustainable I mean it, it can you can continue to define it and it has potential and I would say that the res, the responsive cities are sometimes connected to uh, organizations that have strong competition culture. I mean, in Belgium, as maybe you know, there's a very good competition structure called Open Opera with a Baumeister who has a really clear agenda to improve the level of architecture. And that competition structure, it just happens to suit us quite well. Um, and that is, there's a, there's a reason why we built and are building so much in Belgium. That's a fundamental reason. But of course, culturally, we can connect. It's a little bit exotic, but it's also familiar, sort of not so far away, two hours by train. Um, and I think the, another thing I would say is that uh, we've really enjoyed working in Hamburg, Antwerp, port cities. It sounds really somehow simple, but there's, there's definitely, in my experience, a kind of openness in a port city, politically. You know, re even down to development, developers, there's a sort of, we've found, we're really enjoying working in Hamburg and in Antwerp. There, there's a, an idea of outreach and openness and a sort of pluralistic attitude. Of course, Antwerp has its political problems right now, and these things happen. However, there's that sort of uh, aspect. And so... Ideas, being open to ideas, like anything, it's, you sort of see an opportunity and you run for it, and then there are other opportunities that are, are stopped. And you know, we don't. We we just try and do the best we can in each situation, I suppose. And but we we do try and identify where the possibilities are quite early on. So we kind of put all our energy in certain directions that we can feel this could this could work. You know, this we could get support for this. Uh, you have mentioned teaching. Uh, you have that experience as a professor. 
Uh, what is the situation of young architects and absolvents in these cities? You mentioned Brussels, Zurich, London. Uh, are they satisfied and motivated to study architecture and be architects? Because this is the topic in Czech Republic right now, uh, that uh, our young architects are not very motivated to continue and they are not very happy in the situation of uh, young architects and uh, students mm. uh, on college. Uh, so Well, I, yeah. Again, it's a massive question that you asked there, and I have to answer it in like three sentences. But you have more. Well, yeah, you know what I mean. Of course, it's because it's a really complicated issue. I, I think I what I would say is that I do understand that. I mean, the world is a different place now, and post COVID, um, the attitude that I see in the workplace is so different to the past. Um, the kind of uh, balance of working and quality of life and suddenly became seen to be much more uh, at the, in the consciousness of young people uh, which I understand but it's a different world to the one I came from where it was just about graft you know hard work is the only answer um, and then therefore a certain acceptance which isn't necessarily good but it's the that's what happened but what I would say about motivation is that I do feel that schools of architecture that invite outsiders in, outside teachers, architects. I think teachers as architects is also is, is a very good thing, a good combination of academic full-time teachers, but practicing architects teaching is a good mix. But to invite outside architects into schools, I do believe broadens the outlook of students. And you know, I know certain schools that don't really follow that culture, and I really see the kind of narrowness of um, the exploration. Um, so, I what, uh, what was the question? Yeah. Uh, what is the situation of stu students yeah, around yeah, right. uh, around Europe? I mean, schools vary in quality and presence. Uh, I mean, I think generally mainland European schools are in a really good place because of the often the studio structure. Um, in Munich, I teach with a, a colleague, Bruno Krucker. We, we set up a studio that was based on a dialogue of two teachers with supporting assistants. We have about 150 students. We see every one of them every two weeks. And we teach in an old-fashioned analog way. Uh, and it seems to work. But I think if teachers don't attend face to face with their students they can't expect to get motivation you know you, there's a kind of contract isn't there between the students and the professor or the teacher that has to be honored both ways i think um, and not too often either the students expect a lot without giving and vice versa the teacher somehow thinks they're you know, uh, the balance of exchange is wrong. So I favor almost the atmosphere of an of a architectural studio. You know, like the, in Studio Crooker Bates in Munich, we invited all the students to work inside the chair. So it's really like a lively office um, where teachers and assistants and students and master thesis students are all working and work alongside each other. And I think these kinds of barriers or thresholds, hierarchies um, are not always helpful in an education situation when they're more blurred and you're sort of a more collective spirit. I think it can provide a lot of motivation. Uh, there is a question, anonymous question from Slido, but it's uh, related to this topic. Uh, how do you stay so curious and passionate about architecture? Was there ever a point when you wanted to quit architecture? <laughs> I'm very committed, I agree, and my wife is sitting at the back probably going, yeah, right. Uh, um, I, don't, I can't explain my enthusiasm. It's what I, it is the condition I have, and I hope I, I, <laughs> we generate that in the studio, um, a very sort of strong sense of trying to make good things and working carefully. Um, I don't know if I've ever... I mean, there was one. <laughs> there was one moment I remember. I didn't really want to go into the office because we just happened. We were quite small, and we happened to have three clients, and I didn't like any of them. 
And they, they really like mean, kind of mean-spirited people. And it was just a bit of a low point. I think that was the one moment to your anonymous caller uh, that I thought, oh, what am I doing? But it was a short-lived... Uh, actually, we got sacked by one of them. It was perfect. Because I, I said I didn't agree with him or wondered why he was just so mean-spirited and he didn't like that. So we lost the job, which, of course, was a problem because we had no money. But in the end, it was the best thing to do. <laughs> okay, uh, so is there any other question? The last question, maybe? Okay, so this was Stephen Bates. <laughs> <laughs> was. <laughs> That was the long one. That was the long one. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> very good lecture. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. And if you're interested to share this lecture, you will find it on YouTube and our website, praha.camp. So thank you and good night. <laughs>